welcome into a special edition of the Alex Fuse podcast. On today's episode, Kyle, he's a content creator with John Boy Media, and you can follow him on Twitter at Kyle NYY. It stands for New York Yankees, of course. <laughs> Kyle and I connected via Twitter, and of course, Kyle moved up and now is a content creator with John Boy Media. So, Kyle, first of all, thank you for joining the podcast today. How exactly would you say was a turning point where you were at a radio station before doing exactly what? So well, I just want to say thanks for having me on, first of all. Oh, yeah, I've been following what you're doing from a distance for a while now. And uh, to finally be on your show talking to you is pretty cool. So uh, anyway, I was actually working in college athletics for a while, um, yes. right when I graduated from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is in the Pittsburgh area, I started in sports information at a school called Ashland University in Ohio, and I liked it a lot. Um, I just wanted to kind of come back closer to home, so I got a full-time job um, at a college called Swarthmore, that's in uh, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia, and then from there, I went to Westchester University, also in Pennsylvania, and I was a sports information director. And basically, you're the public relations uh, person for the athletic department. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And it was something I really did that allowed me to hone in on all the different skills that you need in media. Because it's a job where you have to really tackle everything from social media to writing articles to keeping statistics to just building relationships uh, with coaches and young student athletes and kids trying to make a career out of sports for themselves and stuff like that. So, I mean, you could go on all day about what sports information is, but it definitely mm -hmm. led me directly to where I am now with John Boy Media because it was a career path that allowed me to hone in on all the different skills you need to learn what it takes to create a good image for a company. Mm -hmm. What would you say the biggest takeaway you learned from working at the college and just your prior experience of coming to pretty much a brand new company that is on the rise, especially for the New York market? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I could go on all day. You know, I mean, these are questions that it's, it's hard to not make them broad. Um, and, you know, doing this yourself. It's just when I started – I was, let's, let's just say, for example, I was posting things and it's like, well, geez, nobody cared about that one. Like, you know, that kind of sucked. Guess I won't do that again. And it was a lot of that until right now. I mean, still today, like I'll post something, I'll create a video, I'll create a graphic, I'll post a tweet that I think is relatable or an Instagram post, whatever. And it may or may not get a lot of engagement, but every time something does get a lot of engagement, I take mental notes and I'm like, okay, that was a good time to post. Um, that was a nice close up image that people seem to really enjoy. You know, the wording there, the verbiage, people love that. And that was something that at first I had no grasp on. So the more and more and more I posted, and this is all social media related, really, I started to figure it out, figure out what it was that people wanted to see. And at small colleges, you don't have that big of a fan base, but you get people's attention still. And when you can figure out how to do it at a small college, now that I'm working in New York media and posting things about the New York Yankees and Major League Baseball, most specifically, of course, there's a much larger audience. So now I can really start to see some of those skills and social media tips that I figured out working at small colleges really come to fruition as I post things that have a much larger following. You mentioned the grabbing someone's attention, no matter how large or small of an audience or following that you have, what would you say a biggest challenge is to simply growing that audience into ultimately the ultimate goal is to increase your following or audience that is following you? So you just have to come up with different ways to draw engagement. And of course, you don't want that engagement to be negative. Like, for example, right now, I could go on Twitter and say, like, something really off the wall. Like, you know, I'm not even going to go there. You know, I could just say something really off the wall and I'll get tons of comments. But like, that's not good. 
Like you want, you want people to engage with your stuff. So your stuff spreads, but you want it to be mostly positive. It could be like a 50, 50 controversy. Cause that'll really get people going, but it's gotta be something that like, isn't going to make you lose fans. So like, mm-hmm. for example, um, let's just say, for example, on the talking Yanks Twitter page, which is something that I've began to run along with the rest of the John, John boy media crew. The other day I posted a clip of Adam Adovino, Yankees reliever, uh, striking out Altuve. And I said, one of these guys is the guest on Talking Yanks tomorrow. And it's not Austin Romine, the catcher, or the guy who uh, says he's too shy to take his shirt off. And, of course, that le- leaves people to believe it's Adam Adovino. But you get a lot of comments, like people goofing around, like, oh, that must be the umpire. Or it must be Marlins man, because he was sitting in the background. That's fun stuff because it's like Mm -hmm. you're drawing engagement in unique ways but like people aren't gonna not be your fan anymore because you didn't get super specific about who the guest was on the show so it's like you gotta think it is it's a teaser and it was sort of a roundabout way to get people to comment like oh you guys must have the umpire coming on um that's just one example of so many that's kind of like a roundabout way to get people to engage with your stuff and really, at the end of the day, the more people engage, the more people share your stuff, the more it pops up on other people's feeds that don't follow you yet. And if you can get your stuff to pop up on other people's feeds that don't follow you yet, that's how you get followers. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, that, that's the broadest way I can explain kind of how I see it. Mm-hmm. What's been one of your most favorite parts about working for John Boy Media so far to this point in time? <laughs> I mean, even without baseball, it's a dream job. I mean, of course, with baseball, we were going to do a lot of cool things. I was going to be working right across the street from Yankee Stadium, which I got to do for a week before New York was shut down. But um, I didn't get to do that with baseball going on, and I wish I had. But it's still just been absolutely awesome with working with a crew of guys that's around my age. I'm 27. Uh, Some guys are a little older, some a little younger working for John Boy Media. And it's just crazy because I was a huge fan of what they were doing. John Boy and Jake and John Boy Media in general were guys that I was following. And then I was like, I should probably start my own little Yankees channel. And I actually just started my Twitter account last May pretty much because of them. And I could have never, ever seen myself working with them. I thought I, thought I might start my own thing. Um, So when I realized that opportunity was possible and I reached out to John Boy said, let me know if you're ever hiring, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, man, I could have never seen this day coming. So my favorite part is just working with a group of guys who are a lot like me and people that I was legitimately a fan of. And now I'm helping them grow what I was a fan of. It's It's hard to wrap my head around, really. And I'm hoping we get baseball back sooner rather than later. Of course, when everything is safe. And they come up with a safe plan to do it because that's when it's really, really going to become a dream job for me. Working right next to Yankee Stadium or just simply a baseball field. It's always a dream job if you're in the sports industry. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when, you know, the world starts to get back to normal a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I guess this uh, podcast is really meant for people that are looking for advice on how to get started in this social media side or podcasting side, what would be your biggest advice to someone that wants to start, wants to grow their following, et cetera, et cetera? What would you tell them? I have kind of a hot take on this subject. And mine is don't quite shoot for the stars immediately. Like relax, you know, take a step back, realize, let's just say you're in college. Like I was, when I was in college, I was surrounded by kids who are like, I can't wait to work for the Pittsburgh Pirates because this is the area I was in, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it's like, well, that's well and good. You know, I'm glad you, you have your sights set on something so big, but there's only so many opportunities at those places and you got to get your feet wet before those places are just going to jump at the opportunity to hire you. You really got to fine tune your skills and things like that. So when you're a student in college or high school or any age or level, you have to start somewhere. So figure out where it is that you can get started at and start there. 
and appreciate your position while plotting your promotion. I actually got that from Jalen Rose. I think he said it on one of those ESPN shows one time. It's appreciate your position while plotting your promotion. You know, when someone gives you an opportunity, like for me, I was in college. Some guy came in to one of my sports journalism classes to talk about sports information because that's what he did. And as soon as that class was over, I went and sat my professor down. His name is Randy Jessick from IUP. He's been there for like 50 years. And I said, what do I need to do to get into that field? Like, who do you know? He gave me a list of people he knows. I emailed them all, all athletic directors at colleges and things like that. And the one that got back to me was Al King from Ashland University, the athletic director. He said, we're looking for a graduate assistant in our sports information department. This is in Ohio. I don't even know that I, I maybe had been to Ohio a couple times. I was like, you know what? I want to work in sports. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And I went to Ohio. So I, I just, I, I picked a place to start and right. I just kind of kept working on things until now. Uh, this is four years after I started at Ohio, I'm kind of in a position exactly where I want to be. I'm on the right trajectory still, for sure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the right trajectory, what kind of went into your plan? You know, what was something that you wanted to accomplish X, Y, and Z? Because I feel like a lot of people, they have those dreams, right? Whether it's yeah. working for the Pirates or the Steelers or the Yankees or whatever team – or if it's outside of sports, working for NBC, ABC, CBS, one of the top broadcasters, they want to be right. the next so-and-so broadcaster. What for sure was built into your own trajectory that you wanted to do? Truthfully, I always have my sights set on the future, like way ahead. I struggle to live in the present. I'm constantly like, oh, what's next? You know, like, you know, I'm doing this right now, but I better keep in mind, you know, what the future is going to be like and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. as far as jobs went, I took it one job at a time. And I never was like, maybe when I was a little kid, I was like, I got to work for the New York Yankees or I want to be a broadcaster for ESPN. But like I said before, there's only so many of those positions available. So when I was about to graduate college, it became, what do I have to do to make a living in sports? I'm like, any job in sports mm -hmm. is better than anything in my mind. And that's because I'm a huge sports geek. That doesn't go for everybody. But for people like you and I, it's let's work in sports and see where that takes us. I saw Stephen A. Smith got that huge contract with ESPN last year. And he said, uh, not everyone can be Jay-Z, but everyone could be Stephen A. And I was like, you know, I'm a fan of some of what Stephen A. Smith had, has to say and stuff like that, but he's basically the Jay-Z of sports media. It's like, sounds a little ridiculous, but like, he is the pinnacle. You know, he's what like a lot of kids want to be right now. And you don't, just because you're not Stephen A. doesn't mean you don't have this awesome job that you can make a living just watching right. sports from. Yeah. So for me, it was like, wh what do I have to do to make a living working in sports? And let's take it from there. And I didn't, like, shoot for the stars immediately. Like I said earlier, I took my job working in sports. I went from one to the next to the next. And here I am working for John Boy Media, which if we can make this thing work, which it's working so far, and when baseball comes back, we can really make this company take off. I mean, this is, this is the dream job. I mean, it's just a bunch of guys, you know, goofing around, talking about sports, making sports content. Like, if I could do this forever – I will. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, any job in sports is fun. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't fun, you won't be in the business for that long. If you're right, that's if you're that's the fun. thing. I was gonna say, if you don't think sports is fun and and working in sports is fun, it, it's not for you. That's for sure. Because mm -hmm. the hours aren't nine to five. You know, if you're in social media, you can't just turn the internet off. I got that from a. Keith McPherson. Some of you might know Keith from Yankees Twitter, and he works at John Boy Media too. He says you can't turn the internet off, which is very true. So don't be, don't plan on working nine to five if you got yourself a sports job. <laughs> no, you're basically working twenty four seven. Yeah, definitely. But that, that's one of the, my favorite aspects of this. It's that constant changing and evolving, really, because 
even now when there are no sports, there is not one Friday like today that is similar to last Friday. Or yeah. what happens today is something completely different is going to happen tomorrow. The world yeah. is evolving every single day, especially in the sports world. Yeah, I got an example for you. It just happened to me two hours ago. I was sitting there and I was watching the newest episode of Talking Yanks where Jimmy and Jake had uh, voicemails sent in and they were just answering questions. And that was my goal today was to work on that and clip up some things from that and share it with everybody. And then out of nowhere, I get a text message from uh, Amy Cohen. She was the Westchester field hockey coach when I worked there. And she's like, look at this. It was the USA Today article by Bob Nightingale with – the MLB's proposed plan to realign all the divisions. And apparently, if you haven't heard this yet, they're thinking about putting all the teams at their spring training facilities and realigning the, 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 the divisions based off of what would require the least amount of travel. So the Yankees are in a division with like the Phillies, Pirates, Tigers, and Blue Jays, which if you think about it, that's who they play a lot in spring training. It's because they don't have to travel much to play those teams. And anyway, so that that comes out while I'm doing something else. And I'm like, I got to put this project down and immediately jump on this breaking news that MLB might realign all the divisions. So I went and made this graphic for talking baseball. And now my phone is just constant notifications of people arguing like, I don't like this. I do like this. That's a great division for the Yankees to be in. The Yankees would get crushed. Why aren't they in the same division as the Red Sox? And Mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's just one example of something that could just pop up and it changes all your plans. But I mean, it's so much fun. <laughs> you know, breaking news is something that's always happening and yeah. you just don't know when it's going to happen. It could be yep. at, you know, one thirty in the morning at, during the winter meetings that Garrett Cole is going to the New York Yankees. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I stayed up for that because I knew it was coming. And uh, actually my buddy, Uh, Jose, another guy from Yankees Twitter, suggested I make a video because we all knew that Garrett Cole thing was coming. I mean, for like a week. So I made a video saying like Garrett Cole is now a Yankee and stuff like that. So I waited up that night for the news to break and it broke at like midnight on the East Coast. And I had that video posted right away because I sat there waiting. (laughs) You know, it was one of those moments that you were shocked, but looking back at it now, Kyle, it almost seems like it was years ago. Yeah, oh, and, my God. You know, it doesn't even feel like, you know, it's crazy to think that, sure, Garrett Cole pitched for the Yankees in spring training, but he has not yeah. had a official game with the pinstripes on just yet. It is depressing because we've been waiting as Yankees fans years for the Yankees to get one of these, you know, blue chip free agents, uh, as Brian Cashman called him, the white whale. Mm-hmm. It had been a while since the Yankees really emptied the bankroll for a guy like that, and they finally did it, and now we got to wait. Mm-hmm. And we all know what age does to you in baseball and stuff like that, so let's hope this doesn't drag out long enough to the point where Garrett Cole starts to get a little bit older in this contract. <laughs> you know, it's a great point. You know, and yeah. you look at the, the deals, you know, would the Yankees have done a nine-year deal with Garrett Cole – if they would have known that this would have happened. Obviously, you can't predict a pandemic in the world, but still, it it goes into what the Red Sox have traded away Mookie Betts, or I I think the opposite would be, what the Dodgers have accepted the trade, sending Alex Verdugo and Jeter down to the Red Sox for basically David Price. And Uh, I mean, you have to imagine the answer, I mean – it, it's no way. I mean, especially if they don't play a season at all. Are you right. telling me they just traded away some of their top prospects and now they're not even going to get anything for it because Mookie's contract is up at the end of the season. And if the season doesn't happen, now they just mm-hmm. never have him. The Dodgers never have this guy. I mean, if you ask me, you got to put a plan in place where the Dodgers get Mookie next year or something on like some sort of deal that still gets Mookie paid. I don't know. I honestly do think personally, the deal should be voided. If there is not a season, the deal should be voided. That's just my opinion. Just you imagine it, it, it's not fair. It's yeah, not fair you're right. Um, to the Dodgers to, you, you know, if they want to rework something, you know, I think maybe that would make more sense. 
but you know to send back Jeter Downs or Alex Verdugo and you can keep Price or or you know we'll give you more money something else but it's just not fair can you imagine if they void the deal and let's say the Red Sox sign Mookie again after the season or just some other team signs Mookie even right 10 years from now or let's say 20 years from now when Mookie's going into the Hall of Fame or whatever it may be the clips of him in like a Dodgers uniform for like a month that'll be like when Michael Jordan had to wear number 45 or whatever it was right. like you know it's yeah. like look at when it'll be like remember when Mookie was on the Dodgers it's like barely if that's what happens <laughs> yeah hasn't even played an official regular season game with the Dodgers so right you know we'll see what happens uh but again this is a podcast that we want to try to help give some advice to someone that wants to start out and I know um, you had the hot take and not shooting for the stars yeah but again you know, how could someone maybe get started doing a podcast? Now, starting a podcast, I was on a podcast at one point back in college. Is something you would know more about because um, I don't have my own podcast right now. I'm just working for the ones that Jimmy and Jake do. But if you're going to start a podcast, and you and I have had this conversation off air a few times already, it's be persistent in who you're reaching out to make connections. You know, don't be afraid to bug somebody. What's the worst they could say is no. And nowadays you want people sharing your stuff. You want people coming on your show who have a large audience, because let's say, for example, you got Jason Stark to come on your podcast. Now Jason Stark shares this podcast with his fan base, which is very large. And he's just an example. Now people tune into your show. They hear it once. And maybe some people only are going to listen for the Jason Stark episode. But you're going to get a few people hooked for the rest of time. So like Talking Yanks, Jimmy and Jake had Adam Adovino on recently. That's a pretty big get for them. They had Luke, Luke Voigt on recently. All during this pandemic. That's all the sports that people are going to get right now is interviews with players who are home. Mm -hmm. trying to get through this so if somebody tunes in like oh i know luke voigt let's see what these guys are doing they're now possibly hooked forever because they heard the comedic undertone that jimmy and jake use and they hear how relatable they are to the players and how relatable they can be to people like myself who at one point was just working at a college and stuff like that so it's you got to come up with different ways to get people hooked and the fact of the matter is you can't just rely on your own image to get you through forever. You know, there are only so many people who care about what I have to say. So it's like, what can I do to get new fans in who want to hear from somebody else? And now I might have some people hooked to hear what I want to say for the rest of the time. It's like, oh, that's that guy who interviewed, like for you, it'd be who interviewed Jason Stark, um, or whoever else, you know, like Chris Sheeran from Yes Network, stuff like that. It's like, how, what can you do to get people to listen once and then stay on forever? Mm -hmm. What would you say is the biggest piece of someone getting hooked? Is it just the engaging content that you yeah. use to put on Twitter? Or is it just the verbiage of the tweets? Is it the timing? What would you say... I know we talked about a little earlier in this podcast of, you know, the top five things that you could basically do to get someone hooked. But what would you say is the most important piece to get someone hooked to click on that link or to hit the subscribe button or to leave that review on the podcast? I think, you don't. Know, I think you want to be super relatable. Like you want to, people, if they're going to listen to you speak for an hour, they want to be listening to someone who doesn't think they're like above you. They want to be listening to somebody who they can relate to. It's like, okay, I see what he's saying. Like, I agree with that. Or he actually is taking the words right out of my mouth or something like that. But they also want real. And that's part of the reason I really liked John Boy and Jake because I would listen to them for an hour and they wouldn't just say everything they think you want to hear. They would be real, but they would bring it to a level of relatability that – so many people can relate to and I feel like that's how you get people to continue listening to you 
Now, granted, people love guys like Colin Coward and, you know, he thinks he's king of the world and Skip Bayless and stuff like that. So there is a way to do it, but those guys were given a seat by ESPN and Fox and things like that. So we talked a little bit about starting your own thing. I mean, those guys started from the ground up, sure, but it wasn't until they got the seat at Fox and ESPN that they really took off. So I'm more so speaking from a level of starting from the ground up, which is what guys, the guys who started John Boy Media did. And I think it's just about being relatable, saying the things that people want to hear, but also being real and giving people something that, you know, they're not going to be screaming at the radio. Like, what are you talking about? Like you have to have an explanation for everything you say. And I just think that's the way you get people hooked in is being relatable. Mm -hmm. What would be one of your biggest goals that you want to accomplish with John Boy Media? I want to help them have this company take off. Um, you know, it's not about me. Um, I think it's cool that I have this little platform where every time I retweet something we do, it gets more shares and likes and things like that. But ever since I started with them, it's become more about what I can do for them. And right. today, for example, I made this graphic where I listed all the teams um, that are going to be in each new division and stuff like that on the Talking Baseball account is where I posted it. Well, normally I would have posted that on my own account and I probably would have got me some followers and things like that, but that's only going to do me so much good. I mean, these guys got the platform already in, in set up. You know, they've got advertisements. They're getting paid for their YouTube channels and stuff like that. So it's become, what can I do to really help them take this company from a startup to... I guess a little bit of a sports media company that people are really relying on for news and funny mm -hmm. videos and takes and things like that. So in order to make this a job that I'm going to have for the rest of my life, I want to prove that I'm somebody that can really help them get more engagement on their social media pages, on their podcasts, um, just have people become fans of them and us as a whole. And in order to do that, I've got to kind of put myself to the side and really focus on what I can do to help the company as a whole. And I think that's something that's going to want them to keep me around for a long time. And that's the goal right now is to make a career working for John Boy Media. Mm -hmm. And once again, thank you all for tuning in for this podcast with Kyle and myself. Again, we hope that this provides a new insight if you are just starting up in this industry and career and you want to either start up a podcast or continue to grow your own podcast. Kyle, where can everyone follow you on social media and follow along with John Boy and all the videos and the segments and the interviews that we were talking about throughout this whole show? So you can follow the John Boy Media pages just at John Boy Media. That's on Instagram, Twitter. The YouTube page has a very large following. Some of the shows under the network, um, the Yankees-related show is Talking Yanks. That's on all the different channels as well. Talking Baseball is the MLB-wide podcast. Um, we have Joe's McFly with us. He does Pinstripe Strong. We do giant stuff. There's a Talking Giants hosted by Bobby Skinner. There's a music show. Uh, called Talkin' Folk. Keith McPherson does an NBA show called Talkin' Nets. I mean, the, they, the list goes on and on. Um, but if you want to follow me personally, it's at KyleNYY on Twitter, Instagram. I do some stuff on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. That's the John Boy Media rundown as well as my personal one. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on today. This was a lot of fun. And, again, yeah. the hope is someone learned and took away – something from this and to if you want to start up your own thing or you want to continue to grow and i hope uh you learned something today so kyle thanks again for coming on today yeah man when i have my own little show maybe uh i want to have you on too because i think people i'm sure a lot of your listeners already know some of this stuff but where you are as a sophomore in college and a 19 year old it's hard for me to wrap my head around because i was a goofball when i was 19 man so i'm sitting here saying don't shoot for the stars and stuff like that uh, but you're doing it and you're succeeding at it at 19. It's pretty impressive that you're doing what you're doing. And uh, it's an honor to have been brought on your show, man. So thank you.